as always happens in the film business, it's always like water, and you're pretending it's you're like, mm, oh my god, that's oh yeah, that's so that's so strong. But it was actually just a bottle of vodka. <laughs> I'm just like, fucking hell. This is a movie called The Near Room, which you uh, shagged up, you? You shagged Tommy. That's all, son. Which is a film about child prostitution and pornography in Glasgow, which is the, the city that I was born and bred. I'd never acted before, and I had never done that. But I was obsessed with, uh, my character was obsessed with Muhammad Ali, and was quoting Muhammad Ali right there. I remember being completely out of my depth. I remember being, not having a clue what I was doing and being really excited to be with these exceptionally interesting, fun people who whose lives were very different from anything I thought I could have. It, it was good, I got the part, thank God. It was the only part I've ever got where I was told in the room at that moment that I had the role. So that was pretty awesome. That was my first ever audition, so that was good. I'd never acted before that and I'd never done, there was no acting class or acting school or anything at my, my high school, so. So really, I just got lucky. I got very, very lucky. I was excited, and I was. In, I think, as with all actors, the best part about a job is the moment you get the job, and then you get the fear. And that it's happened to me on job number one. So the next film is a film called The Last King of Scotland, which was about a real person called Idi Amin, who was a despotic dictator in uh, Uganda in the 70s. And um, uh, I play a fictional character called Nicholas Garrigan, who uh, was sort of an amalgamation of two or three different real people that were in and around Idi Amin at that time. He perpetrated people, as all, often happens with, um, it seems, great villains of, of real life. He seemed like a clown, he seemed like a comedy, almost, you know, a, a figure of parody. And, and of course, during all that, people let him off the hook. Because of all that, people aren't paying attention properly and you end up getting an absolute nightmare on your hands and the guy perpetrated great crimes. The film kind of treads that narrative path where I first meet him and I just think he's this larger than life, slightly buffoonish, charismatic superstar of African politics. And then you realize that there's a, there's a massive, there's a brutal and vindictive undercurrent running through his regime. It was a wonderful experience. I got to go to Africa, leave my country properly for the first time, not just go to France, not just go to Italy, not just go to Spain, but to go to somewhere which is so culturally different and not just visit there, but work there, which is always a different experience. You always get a different kind of access and um, a different kind of education when you're in a country to work, I find, especially in the film industry because every door opens for the film industry. You get access to the most incredible places and people. And so that was a real privilege at the age of like 23, I think I was. So it was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. There was a scene where I was playing football or soccer with uh, a bunch of kids, a lovely guy called Sam Akello. And Sam was meant to be drinking like whiskey or something like that or, or vodka or something. And it, so it was like, as always happens in the film business, it's always like water and you're pretending. It's you're like, mm, oh my God, that's, oh yeah, that's so, that's so strong, but it was actually just a bottle of vodka. <laughs> I'm just like, fucking hell. So that was, that's something that sticks with me. I drink, I've always had a drink, but uh, I'll take a drink. But uh, I wasn't aware that I was gonna be ingesting vodka in the middle of a game of football, in which we were just playing football for a couple of hours and I was shattered. And then you take a massive slug of vodka and you're like <laughs> So the next scene is from the movie uh, X-Men Days of Future Past, and it's a scene in which I'm making myself appear in Mystique's mind and trying to get her to not kill the President of the United States. It was cool, actually. It was fun because it was also a scene that when we were talking about doing it, they were like, well, you're trapped under there and you're shouting out to her. And I was like, I'm Charles Xavier. I'll just touch my temple and I will I can stand right in front of the President. So I liked the idea that if she was going to have to shoot the President, she was going to have to not literally shoot me, but she was going to have to visually shoot through my body. And so I was cool. And Simon and Brian were always very up for ideas. They didn't always take us up on our ideas, but more often than not, they actually did listen to what I had to say. So it was part of the reason why playing Charles was such a great joy for me. So I loved that cartoon when I was a kid. So getting to jump into that role as an adult was a joy. I also had certain like personal reasons why I wanted to work in the UK at that time, and it was filming in the UK. I was like. That's perfect. So no, there was no hesitation. I feel like people keep saying, you know, you want to make a third it movie? I'm like, no. And they go, why not? And you go, because everything needs to end. Otherwise, there's no good story structure. Stories are beginning, middle, and end, and that's the end for me. 
So it's been a good story for me.